Welcome to Rise and Shine. I'm Shelby Barrett, the Stone for the Stone Roadie Show, and it's time to wake and bake with Craig Reed and Griff Martin. The Stone Roadie Show, podcast number <laughs> 152. Action. All righty then, looky here, looky here. This is podcast 152 of the Stoned Roadie Show, and it's also episode 35 of the Wake and Bake Morning Buzz, and it's Friday morning, and it's April 5th. Well, actually, we're, we're cheating on this one because uh, <laughs> we're going to do this the night before because we got our, well, my name's Craig Reed, the Stone Roadie, and this is my co-host, Griff Martin, the rocket scientist, and with us today, we got our special guest, Mr. Steve Lawler, and why don't you take it away there, Griff? Yeah, it's really great to have Steve Lawler on here. Um, I got to meet Steve at the monument back October uh, last year, and uh, Steve said, yeah, he'll come on the podcast and, and kind of help us out with raising some funds for the uh, forgotten survivors. And, uh, and Steve actually is a forgotten survivor himself, but he don't, he don't need the funds. He's doing pretty good, but he's uh, <laughs> sympathetic to those that do. And, uh, interesting guy, uh, Steve Lawler here, man, this guy here, he, uh, used to work for clear light, uh, which was, uh, I guess the uh, company that did the lighting for Leonard Skinner back in the day. And he's worked with, uh, people like Peter Frampton as a production manager, Fleetwood Mac, Rolling Stones, Willie Nelson, and on and on and on and on. So he's got a lot of really cool, uh, experiences that we hope he can share with us. And, uh, and we're going to uh, have a little chat with him here and pick his brain. And uh, and we call it, Steve, we call it skin formation on the uh, on the podcast when we start talking about Skinner. But uh, it's information that's uh, really good stuff for all the bands that he's worked with and stuff. So really kind of just want to find out a little bit starting from the beginning. Steve, how did you get into the uh, music business? Well, when I was in high school... By the way, I'd like to really thank y'all for your donations and stuff. I'm real proud of y'all, so I will get on with that. When I was in high school, um, I worked at a windmill dinner theater here in Houston, and um, that kind of led me wanting to get into entertainment. I, I had been out and saw some movies being made out in this little town in West Texas, the Alamo. They made the Alamo, met John Wayne and all those guys out there, and I kind of got the bug, but then I, I saw it never being filmed, kind of, when I was in high school. I worked as a stage hen, and that's where I learned. And then I went to the University of Houston, and uh, that's kind of where I learned how to do arenas and stadium shows. And that's where I met Ronnie and Rodney Ackerman, and they own Clear Light. And we started doing kind of smaller shows, and then... Um, then we it kind of took off, you know. Ronnie and Ronnie was doing Skinner, and uh, Rodney was kind of doing Ten Years After and Fleetwood Mac. And they because there because there wasn't a lighting company back then, not not too many of them, right? Right. Well, uh, my, you know, like we'd do Elton John or or the Almond Brothers or somebody and do their lights locally in the early seventies, but. It started changing in 72, 73. People started carrying lights, you know, and sound, sound first. And Shoko was the dominating um, sound. And then, then they started doing lights. They were actually doing Skinner's lights. And then Ronnie changed it uh, on that tour. That's so that. uh, Ronnie, of course, the history with Ronnie, I guess he, he worked with Fleetwood Mac pretty close and then rodney was with peter frampton yes yeah yeah well rodney kind of i think he actually did fleetwood too oh but okay we were with him they were just his you know they had accounts and rodney was really getting into management and, and uh you know and then he, he's because i don't know how he got with skinner but he he became their road manager and, and then was you know Got it. Of course, he wanted to put his lights out there, and <laughs> that's what happened. And you, and you kind of said when you were in school, 
you uh, did a little thing back and forth with the Rolling Stones. Yeah, that was in 75. It was during the summer, you know, and we'd run, we were running around and the, the production manager, the people who kind of started our business, the two production managers, uh, was uh, Michael Ahern. He was from New York. So he ran the uh, Fillmore in, in New York, and then Patrick Stansfield was uh, uh, the West Coast. He he was in San Francisco, and you know they worked for Bill Graham. And then as the big tours started going out, Dylan, the Stones, Patrick was doing the Stones, and Michael Ahern was doing that Bob Dylan tour in like seventy four, seventy five, somewhere in there. And that's where I ran into those guys. And they kind of had, and I learned a lot from them, and and that they really started the production into what we do now. And what, Patrick was doing the Stones, so we were helping him out. What was that like when you uh, was working with the Stones? Did you get to, you know, like hang out with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards oh, and those no. guys? And any? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I've kind of run into them a couple of times. You yeah. Know, stories, but. Certainly not carrying on casual conversation. There's, they they need something. I, I was turning out the house lights, and they were hanging out all around us. And one time, Keith Richards, we were at the Cotton Bowl. He uh, came out. I just happened to be standing there. I don't know why, but his road manager, whatever she was, said that the the thing was decked out ice carving sushi you know this incredible stuff but he wanted pigs in a blankets what we call them and, and i had to you know just dough wrapped around a little hot dog and i had i went and asked the caterer she said steve those are frozen man we gotta, i said well go down and get some more he wanted those i day hot dog he was a character <laughs> that's kind of funny yeah. And, and w so how long were you on the road with them? You think just, uh, you did it oh, like back and forth, right? Yeah. I, I would just say I'll help them sub Patrick. I, well, I probably did about 20 of the shows. I really worked hard on the Memphis show at the, and then the cotton bowl. And, and it was funny during that cotton bowl show in 75, we did, uh, we were doing Willie's picnic and we were doing the lights down there too with another lighting coming it wasn't clear i mean uh clarify so but uh yeah it's about the hardest i ever worked i think i was up for like 60 hours or something we built the stage for the stones down there yeah, well and then was it fleetwood mac that you you kind of did something with them next well no kind of what happened was if you want to hear that i guess i don't want to say some of the names here but in December, I got a phone call because one of the <laughs> crew from Clearlight had gotten caught in bed with one of the members of Fleetwood Mac. Oh, okay. By, by, <laughs> by the husband. And so he said, man, can you go out tomorrow to Fleetwood Mac? I go, no, I can't because I got a final tomorrow. And I'm sure my grades, I needed that final, I'm sure. But anyway, um, and then the, the, I send my buddy out with Fleetwood and then um i think it was about february i had decided to take a semester off the draft it ended and so i and i really wanted to go on the road that was my dream to see the world and uh i got a phone call ronnie called me said well that person's back in good grace can you go out with this guy peter frampton and i said sure and i flew up to chicago the argonne ballroom and um it, it was incredible. We were playing smaller arenas and uh, big theaters, and then we were in stadiums before you knew. We just had to learn as we went. You know, everybody says, "Where did you learn this stuff?" Well, just doing it. That's you know. Now there's colleges and all kind of stuff. It's such a business now. So, was you around uh, Frampton when he did the uh, Frampton Comes Alive? Oh yeah, yeah. I was through that whole thing. Yeah, we, what was that like? It was fun. <laughs> I, I remember hearing him in an interview saying that um whenever they had the recording truck outside and you know, they didn't realize that it was gonna turn out that good. Oh, he, it was like his greatest hits album and Yeah. Yeah, and, and um yeah, that was in seventy five they did all that recording and then 
we started out in 70, and that album just blew up while we were on. We didn't even know how big he was. I mean, you know, we we never even had a day off. We, we'd do 28 shows in a row, that, you know. I remember one time we had to take the day off. We flew down to Phoenix to uh, film. They were they needed a stadium show for A Star Is Born, and, and that was actually a Peter Frampton show. And uh, with Santana, Bill Graham was there, and um, uh, Barbara Streisand, Chris Christopherson. You know, they all had up there on the stage. We were watching, but that was our day off. <laughs> Uh, and that and that was kind of uh crazy uh because i when that same interview i'd heard him talking about that you know rodney eckerman was his uh i guess his road manager and um and they had all their gear on the plane uh on the equipment plane and it was actually a conveyor and uh four people got killed on that when it crashed i guess they had a strap break loose on a on a pallet and that's when he lost that guitar that black beauty and then come to find out later on that it wasn't uh burned up in the plane crash that uh so uh yeah so he got that guitar back which was pretty cool do you remember any of that uh, Steve? Wait, you know that happened uh they were down in panama they left it was funny because this friend of mine jay do jay do d dewarco was um his guitar roadie at the time and uh they had these big old blue cases and um uh, they held about six or eight guitars in each one and they were really tough and i, I wasn't on that tour and everybody thought i was on that plane you know it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's like 79 or something they they were down in panama and it's it pretty rough touring down there back then, man. You, you had the. Uh, <laughs> I think it was from? actually Caracas, Caracas, Venezuela. I oh, yeah. Is yeah. where it was. Yeah. yeah they just left Panama, I think. Uh, I'm not real sure. They, they were headed down to Brazil after that, and that, that plane crashed. And JD was supposed to be on it, I think he told me, but he backed out. So that, there wasn't anybody on it that we knew. They were just local people. <laughs> You know, <laughs> where did he get that sign? You got one. Too. Well, well, he's uh, he's kind of he's got a reason for doing that because he he thinks that the, our monetization got uh, got compromised. You know, we get paid for these YouTube uh, yeah, yeah. podcasts, and he thinks when it, when he takes a hit off his bowl, that's not a good thing. They don't like that. So, I don't... Uh, it seems but... like everyone's doing that now. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's only cigarette <laughs> tobacco, right? right? <laughs> Where did y'all get those signs? Because I know I know somebody that needs one of those. Oh, we can get you one. We can get oh. you one. We got Dave the Disciple, <laughs> that guy right there. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of like a printer, and he supports us. He prints all of our stuff for us, and. Well, yeah, tell we, them to print one up for me. I, I yes, yeah, I up. got one. I'll let you have this one, and I'll send this to you, and he'll give me another one. <laughs> okay. He made yeah. Kathy Gazi one that says, "Sorry, I'm not stoned." Oh. <laughs> She's a school teacher, you know. Yeah, yeah. I see her on there. Where, how'd y'all hook up with her? Well, she she actually uh, met Alan Collins when she was just a kid, and she saw. Uh, she saw the uh, <coughs> real estate sign, a Leonard Skinner real estate sign on the album and called the number. And uh, Gene Odom happened to be there and Leonard Skinner answered it and, and said, well, here, you know, I guess she was in Jacksonville and she talked to Gene and Gene said, well, I'll take you over to Alan's house. You know, it was just that easy. And then, so she went over there to Alan's house and, and uh got to meet alan and sit down and bullshit with him and you know she was kind of like you know starstruck on old alan you know that he was such a normal guy though yeah they, they really all were it's like she got some really cool pictures at alan's house while she was there too she's been showing yeah and then later on i guess uh i guess after the uh the crash and it was uh alan collins and or i forget who it was when she met you 
Craig, and she said you were kind of like uh <laughs> Terry Ross at the Collins, <laughs> and then and then she came to an Allen Collins. So yeah, she said <laughs> she met me at a Rossington Collins show. And I was trying to get her on the bus or whatever. <laughs> yeah, she's a school teacher, so she kind of helped <laughs> legitimize us a little bit. You know, we need all the help we can get. <laughs> I'll do a great job. I'm. I got to tell you, I, before this interview, like I told y'all, it's like I, I watched probably about. I had seen them before, you know, they pop up on my Facebook page or whatever, but they, um, I've been watching several of them catch up. Y'all do a great job. It is like, well, the, the early ones were a little crude, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, now it's kind of more like just a conversation. You know, we were, uh, we were cutting our teeth and then, uh, you know, we got about a hundred of them and, you know, and then, then we started doing the morning show. And so we started, up in our game a little bit but uh it's great it's great to have you on here because you know people they love the guests and uh they're really gonna they're gonna like this one because all the great uh, information that you're giving us so we so then you we were see, we Peter. seem to be doing a lot better since we we've been opening it up opening it up to more questions and stuff yeah. you know we yeah. ask for questions you know I, that's kind of like people people wanted me to write a book. I said, man, I don't want to write a book. I said, but I'll, I'll do a podcast and people can come on and, you know, ask me questions. I don't mind doing that, you know, and it just kind of evolved from there. But then, uh, you yeah, know, we started get, being more focused on, you know, answering people's questions and people seem to like that, you know. <laughs> I'm the same way. It's funny because everybody always said, why don't you write a book? I go, no, my mother would have to read it. And uh, <laughs> I'm gone now. And my only excuse now is I, you'd have to name names. And I don't think that's fair. Yeah. For me, I just. Yeah, I think that's I, why they're waiting on Ed King's book to come out. You know, I think uh, Sharon King's try, trying to, uh, you know, make sure that she does everything without, you know, too much controversy. But I think it's going to be a good book. Yeah, but when you know, does come out. because he's a little different because it was all personal. Me, you know, I just saw it through the backstage, you know, and, and you know, I knew a lot of people, but it's still, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't think anybody would read the damn thing. I, do, I believe they would. You'd, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so, so you were with Frampton for how long were you with Frampton there? Uh, I did, uh, all of 76 uh we went to europe and then um that so let's see 77 started when i was gary wright for about four months or whatever it was and then we started frampton Stadium <laughs> in june of um and in jfk stadium it was like 100 Ten thousand people there. It was. That's the one where Ronnie got in a fight that I saw Gene Odom telling about. Because I had finished loading out, we went back to that because we always stayed at that hotel there that at the by the Spectrum. You know where JFK was right there, uh, and the Spectrum was right there. And it was a, a it was a white hotel. I I saw it the other day because we were playing uh, with. I was there with Bad Bunny. <laughs> gone downhill a little bit but the stones stayed there when we were there and you know it, all the bands stayed there and uh i got back to that bar man all hell had broken loose and, and the, the staff had quit we were being our own bartenders i think the fight had already happened it was over a gold poncho belt you know those ones with all the the nuggets around them that was kind of like is, who, is, who was in who was in the fight steve that was that one that gene told y'all about ronnie and dickie bet oh Betts, you yeah. you were there oh yeah yeah, yeah. oh was, wow yeah it was the show was like um dickie Betts was the opening band he kicked one of the monitors off the stage i thought the monitor guy was gonna kill him uh because he was the opening act and and i don't know who all was it was gary wright i think jay giles uh skinnered and peter and uh, i guess dickie was down in the bar swinging the belt around saying leonard skinnered sucks or something oh, yeah. right and by the time i'd gotten there dickie was in jail 
<laughs> and, and I got to tell you, Ronnie wasn't a really big guy, but I saw him in a couple of scraps. He didn't want to mess with him. He, he, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he would just hit you until you could probably big old guy hit him. Wouldn't matter. <laughs> well, those short guys, they have a low center of gravity. They're hard to find. <laughs> well, I you think know. he was just, he's one of those guys that just didn't quit. Right. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. He was right on the airplane one night. <laughs> with joe barnes <laughs> yeah we'll just leave it at that <laughs> oh you were there for that too oh i was kind of road managing that night because when i got <laughs> it, joe 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 showed me the uh the bite mark with it it looked like a piranha he, I, I, he bit a hole in me. yeah he did he had out boot and just beating i, I was sitting there going anyway, it was so funny because i i'm assuming you're going to edit this one out <laughs> no no uh -uh. <laughs> anyway so so it was over a, a bar we had built for yeah uh, that the old trinkety wooden bar yeah, yeah that was yeah shit, right so right so um I guess Barnes wanted to get rid of it, so he sold it to Charlie Daniels, and that's no. He left it on the damn the loading dock. He just left it on the loading dock, man. Gotcha. And so took the wheel uh, took the wheels off of it and just left it on the loading dock. Because I so when Ronnie couldn't go out, I kind of in that area. I had no idea when that was, but I would go out with the band kind of, there was a guy named Robert Delgado. He was a security. <laughs> uh huh. He was from Houston. <laughs> and, um, me and him would kind of be road managers as much as nobody was really their road manager. You couldn't. <laughs> it was such a different world. And I'd come out with Peter, you know, with Peter, it was pretty, a little bit more structured. You know. <laughs> more organized i remember that fight on that plane that's the worst fight i think i ever saw my was life. was ronnie actually trying to open the door to throw him out because that's what we'd heard <laughs> no, I, I don't we would not at that height the door won't open now I, I was telling you the story i think craig probably remembers this when we <laughs> land and take off a lot of times we'd keep that front door open to get some air in the plane i remember that shutting that damn door when it, right before you took off yeah <laughs> was that the conveyor you mean yeah 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 but the uh the fight that other fight that wasn't on the conveyor that was oh, a different yeah, yeah. I, I stood up because I, I figured well hell i guess i'm supposed to do something and um gary told me to sit down that the rule was he who won the fight was right <laughs> did you did you the... ever fly on the first plane with less I, I think so you know i I, the brown, uh, the brown, tan, and brown and white plane, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I flew sometimes in '75 with them. I guess seven. I had to have maybe sometimes in '76 when we were worn out with Frampton, and then um, then in '77, get back on the story. We we did the Peters Stadium tour. They did a. Uh, Skinner had opened about four or five shows with us. And uh, and then it ended up in September, I guess. I think about the 1st of September. And then we put a lighting rig together and went out with uh, Skinner. And uh, there you go. Um, didn't, didn't they land the plane and kick Joe Barnes off the plane? That, that, that's what it is. Uh, I, I think that's the last time I, we were flying at night. So yeah, he got off the plane with us where we were going. I'm pretty sure. And never came back. I mean, I wouldn't have either, but he just got the shit kicked out of. <laughs> so Frampton and Frampton and Skinner, they kind of toured a lot together then. Right. I don't know. On that stay. I don't recall in 76 Skinner ever opening for Peter. Uh, but th they were kind of, it's kind of more of, you know, the, the stadium tour where we, there'd be like six acts. And the, the first one we did with the Skinner was on that one. We did, uh, I don't know. You'd have to, it, they probably did about three shows, four shows. I mean, Bob Seeger was on one night and I don't even remember journey. <laughs> well, you, you got, you got to know Peter pretty good, right? I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. We, we did, uh, 
when we came back from, I remember a couple of, you know, yeah, we partied together. We had the, you know, you were around the band a lot more back then than the, the bands today. But uh, we went over to Japan and Australia and New Zealand, came back to through Hawaii. And um, it was the end of the tour. It was like, uh, and this was about a year after uh, we had been in the Skinner flight about exactly because um it was in December. It must have been a little bit after October, but we were in December, and we ended up going over to Maui. And oh man, we had fun. Uh, well, Roy, good... he's, he's pretty per, pretty nice guy, pretty personable oh, yeah. guy, right? Yeah. Skinner, Skinner, and Frampton stayed friends for a long time. Skinner did a thing up in uh, up in Hollywood at uh, 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 Universal Studios with a bunch of guitar players. Uh, uh, Brett Michaels and Peter Frampton showed up, and he was he was up there and played. He he came to a lot of stuff. I recently I I, I, I saw. You know, I, I, I Peter knows me, and I know Peter. He sees me. He knows who I am. You know, I like Peter. Yeah, we um after the crash, we uh I went out with Boss Gags, and uh, then we went out with <coughs> and Then I went back with Peter and. 78 79 and then i that's when i kind of started deciding that i would rather be a promoter rep than touring with the bands because you know it was like kind of came and went is you know everybody in our business kind of you know unless you're working for a company you know and clear light had kind of gone it wasn't really existing anymore so rodney and i worked for a company and then i I at the same time, uh, Pace, who I ended up working for here in Houston, um, they started doing the Texas Jam at the Cotton Bowl in '78. We were out with Foreigner, and we brought our sound system down there, and because uh, TFA, I think that was the name of the company, TFA, the, they did the sound for it because they'd done the California Jam. We went out there and did a. Uh, we did a rock show one day. It was uh, the head of, I mean, you know, it was like 12 bands on the show. But they brought us in to kind of run it for them. And, and so that's when I started doing stadiums for Pate. And I got to know them real well. And um, did a, about 11 of those damn things. So, And then I started working as a promoter with uh, Pace. And then we started building amphitheaters and, um, just doing rock shows all over. Great. Still work for him, really. So when you first started working with Skinner, I guess, um, Ron Eckerman, uh, you were kind of like, uh, kind of taking his place when he wasn't around or something like that. Yeah, and that was going a while when I remember I, I went to Austin. I don't even remember. I remember I was up in Fort Worth one time with him. You know, I did maybe, I don't know. I remember how many times I did it. To be honest, it was like five or six times, maybe. And I got to know, and that's when I guess I met Craig and everybody. And um, it, it, I don't know, even remember when it was. But yeah, Ronnie, every once in a while, would kind of go cover for him. So did uh, did Ron ask you to come on that tour when you when you were on the plane? Uh, yeah. He wanted me to be the production manager. And uh, I guess Ronnie didn't. Ronnie Van Zandt. Oh, yeah? Well, I, 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 you know, Ronnie was kind of starting to, he, he wanted to be a full production company. And, and you know, we'd come off of Frampton, you know, it was a huge stadium tour. And, uh, but Ronnie said no, that, that uh, Ronnie van zandt didn't he wanted to keep his guy which was clayton johnson which worked out great you know it was fine i was i was a lighting guy on that on coming back because i wanted to keep going on the road plus i liked leonard skinner i wanted to go out on the road yeah what well, i was looking forward to it you know and it don't last about a week or two what was that like? Like, uh, the first time that you got out on the road with them, were they, were you thinking, man, these are some crazy son of a bitches oh, here? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I got to <laughs> tell you, so was Peter Frampton. So, was oh, yeah. Frampton. Oh, we were throwing TVs out the windows and pairing up hotel rooms. And 
you know, we were in our middle 20s. The oldest guy was like maybe 30. You know, I mean, it, it was a <laughs> time then, you know, it was before it wasn't a business. We were just out there having fun. And, uh, and yeah, I, I remember a couple of the things uh, when we got started. I, I, I'm pretty sure they, because Artemis wouldn't sleep in the air, right, Craig? I mean, you had to rip the. You had to rip the legs of the bed off. I remember that part. <laughs> and one time, Ronnie, well, you, I made a couple of mistakes by leaving my hotel room open because we, we did that a lot. You know, hopefully you were in the kind of a group and you'd leave the door open and people kind of come and go during the day or not when you had a day off. And um, that got us in trouble some. I mean, fire hoses underneath them and fire <laughs> extinguishers. and Oh, uh, <laughs> they pranked you. Oh, well, yeah. Hopefully you were on the pranking end. Yeah, like when Leon oh, shit in somebody's shoes. <laughs> oh, you put pennies in the door, right? And that it wouldn't open. <laughs> oh, we had all kind of, oh, you'd put some poor guy drunk, put him in the elevator and send him down. I mean, pass down. I mean, on that the water. Anyway, Ronnie walked into my room one time and he said, have you ever seen a TV drunk? And I went, I should have said yes, but I said no. And, and he poured, he had a bottle of Jack and he poured it in the back of that TV. And, you know, the, the water, the, well, it was Jack Daniels walk, going down there through the TV across the circuit boards and it just went hairy and smoke come out of it. Well, you've seen a drunk TV. <laughs> we did that a couple more times. I was by just it was the first time I'd witnessed that. I remember Artemis trying to he didn't want to sleep in the, on the ground. He I mean he had to sleep on the ground. He had to tear him. He lit up a fireplace somewhere. We were traveling near y'all near Craig and Ronnie called us up. Y'all got any hotel rooms? They had been kicked out because I guess Artemis had lit up a, fi a fireplace. It really wasn't a fireplace and. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that so stuff was about every band i mean I, I saw one time he was uh on one of the podcasts uh he uh craig was talking about the riot house that's what we call the the hyatt house down there on sunset one time we we were there and leonard skin i mean um uh, led zeppelin was there they had one floor and we kind of had one floor and that was a hell of a night oh i bet it was some fun times it was so were you were you partying uh, with uh plant and page or did you get well to... they were around in the party yeah i wasn't yeah, yeah they had a, <laughs> all the women were there it was it was fun you know, it, it's funny you tell people those stories now and they go that didn't happen I go, yeah it did <laughs> And yeah, I think you got to witness a little bit of the sweet Connie hanging around too, didn't you? I mean, I think he, <laughs> I, I guess in 76, 77, she came to some of the shows and yeah, <laughs> I tell well, you there was more than her though. She, she just kind of, cause they, they sang that song about her, right? The, uh, uh, grand grand funk. funk yeah. And, and that kind of made her famous. I, I saw her signing autographs and I saw her on TV one time with the Butter Queen. She was from Dallas. Some of the other girls that kind of, but they, there was some in each town. It wasn't just her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Craig says that, you know, he, he was pretty good friends with her. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of people are good friends with him. Uh, you know, uh, Peter Frampton, he, he seems like a real cool guy. I went to see him in Melbourne, Florida at the King center. And, um, and the, and the way those seats are set up, they're like about probably about 50 seats in a row. And he was right in the middle of one of his songs and he just stopped the song and looks out at the audience and goes, how do you people go for a pee? You have to climb over each other, you know, and then, uh, and, and everybody was laughing. Then he just went to playing again. And then recently I saw him, um, you know, now he sits down when he plays, I guess, cause he's got that nerve issue going on and somebody was talking while he was performing one of his songs and he stopped and he said, why don't you just leave? Cause you're pissing me off. 
<laughs> that was just recently. Really? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I was on YouTube and I thought, you know, he seems like a nice guy, but you don't want to ruffle his feathers. Well, I don't blame him really. It's like, yeah, yeah I, did, I did, um, this, <laughs> one of his shows here, I don't know, a couple of years ago, cause I, I wanted to do it. It was out at the amphitheater here in Houston. And, um, I talked to him for a while. That was the last time I talked to him. Yeah. I, I think he's, he's living down around. in Nashville now. So, uh, that's kind of weird yeah i guess he lived there before and then he when he got married he he uh was living in cincinnati and then went back to nashville but i saw him do a rig run down and man that guy is like very knowledgeable about pedals and equipment and amps and preamps and oh my god he's he's a brain it's yeah. just you know but of course he's been doing that his whole life you know and he's and he's got a certain piece of equipment for every song that he does, you know, to make it have that unique sound. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm a big Frampton fan and I got to see him and, and I was actually at the Lakeland civic center, you know, two, two venues before the plane crash. And, um, uh, I got to see Skinner there. Of course I saw Frampton there, but, uh, I was yeah, in little, shows. <laughs> yeah, little, little did I know that one day I was going to be hooking up with this character up here, you know, uh, a buddy of mine, we were in the audience and somebody threw a joint up on the stage and Ronnie picked it up and took a hit and threw it over his shoulder. And Craig ran out there and, and picked it up and then put it out in a sucret box and closed it up and ran, <laughs> ran off stage. And, 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 you know, I never forgot that. And I asked Craig, was that you? And he's, oh yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh switching gears and and moving forward so you were you were kind of working with frampton and then you got working with skinner and then and uh how how long had you been working with skinner before you got on that uh convair 240 uh only those shows i mean you yeah. know the ones we mentioned the ones i kind of road managed and we went out choco was doing the lights so uh and, and then those shows that we were out with on, uh, you know, with Frampton. And then um, that we had just started because Ronnie had shifted gears, put on his, they were going to use his lights, you know, clear light. And so we all went out. So really, I only did those four or five shows as a lighting guy. So when that kicked off, I think you said you'd only been like on like four venues before the, um, when you were going down to uh mississippi and uh when you when you left lakeland that's when the plane started having issues right right you know everybody has a little bit of story about it but so i wore, I wore contacts at the time and i had to take them out and i forgot my glasses and uh so we were we left Lakeland and it, we flew at night. It, it was really different because the the crew flew with the band, so the band would have to wait on us, and then we'd get there. and Craig could probably define all that more, but we we'd take off and we had flown quite a while. and And I was I was right that that day, uh, the seat I was in was right next to the window over the um, the wing, and. Um, the co-pilot came back and, and kind of woke me up. I don't know how he did, but he said, is the plane, is there in the engine on fire? Can you see the fire? And I looked out there and sure enough, it looked like a Bunsen burner. You know, it didn't, it's not like the movies where it looks like a fire. It was a right. Burner. He walked up to the front of the, uh, he said, I'll be right back. And uh, I guess other people saw it too, but, he was talking to me and he came back and he, he changed the fuel mixture or something because it, it went away. And then we flew and landed in Lakeland. I mean, in Greenberg, Spark and Bartenberg and uh, did that show the next day. We spent the night in Greenville and took off the next. Episode. So it, it, a lot of people, you know, they, they have questions about the fact that there were people that had animosity about getting on the plane like cassie you know um and uh do, do you remember any of that people talking no, no i don't i i thought you know 
I was 25, 26. It, I've always been the eternal optimist. I, even when we were going down, I thought he was going to land somewhere. So, um, now I, I never heard any stories like that, but there, there certainly could have been. I mean, the plane was pretty funky. <laughs> you know, that engine making a lot of noise when you took off and that fire. I, I guess a lot of other people saw that plane too because. I thought everybody was asleep, you know, like, and, and you, and a lot of people, I guess, and you were telling me that the air conditioner didn't work in that plane very well at all. No, we, I remember a couple of times we'd land, we, before we'd take off, somebody was in charge of keeping the door open. I don't think I ever did it, but we, I mean, I remember that one time when we landed because, uh, Leslie, we were talking about picking up her son or something. I think that must've been, somewhere in florida and uh we landed the plane and i could hear him on the radio going who is this because we we're supposed to pay a fee we just landed took off I, oh I yeah know, i'm getting off i don't remember but i remember when we were taking off we'd leave the door off, especially down in florida it was hot yeah so and until you got up in the air and then it would start cooling off well we'd shut the door right before it yeah 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 because when you're on the ground taxiing around you're not really getting you know g good air conditioning just like on a regular plane i guess uh but worse for that one so so then you got on the plane there in greenville and uh about what time of day was it you think you got on the plane about three, about three? About three o'clock, so it was time. So we were flying, you know, the right direction. We we're going west, so two o'clock Baton Rouge time. Did you always like go in the back and play poker with the guys? Is that something that you normally did, or like to? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I was playing poker, but when we took off, I wasn't back there. I don't know who I switched, but we'd switch seats all the time. You know, there was no assigned seats. So, you know, like, but, if you felt like going back there, maybe. Uh, playing a few hands of poker you might go in and hey let me sit in or something like that and i guess you know generally once you got in you were in <laughs> you yeah in. so you so you just happened to this time you were actually uh you know you you made your way back there eventually and you were playing poker with craig and mark howard and uh who else was it craig it ron was, uh, I, I thought it was ron Eckerman, oh, it's Steve the, Lawler. the six people that were playing yeah uh, I was sitting next to me. Mark Franks was next to me. Mark uh, Howard was on the other side of the table. We were facing the normal direction going the plane. And Craig was next to Mark. And Ronnie Ackerman was playing with us. And Gene Odom was playing with us. And, and Ronnie was up front, right? And up front. And up front of the, the like, uh, up behind the uh, pilots. A, no, a, no. Oh, Ronnie Van Zandt. Yeah, Van Zandt. I, I, we, I was in the back playing poker, having fun. Um, I all that stuff that happened up front, I was never aware of. Right. So, I, whenever you guys, it, it was pretty uneventful, and then you were, and then you were going along. And when was the first time that you that you knew there was, might be some kind of a problem? Well, the co -pi We were flying at about twelve thousand feet. So the co-pilot came back and told Ronnie, he was the same the guy that uh, uh, told me about the fix the engine. He came back because it wasn't a speaker system. There was no stewardesses or anything. He came back and said, okay, folks, back, um, buckle up. We're, we're going to start landing. And um, we started down and we were flying down Interstate 55 there south of Jacksonville. And I was looking down because it was a, my birthday was on the 19th the day before. So oh, my entire plan was to get to New Orleans somehow. And so landing on Interstate 55 did not help that plan anywhere. <laughs> Somewhere in there, the right engine started quitting, is my recall. This is what, you know, we all have different memories of it, but uh, and, and the I think we we were flying down, and we were down about five thousand feet then. I think because we started down, and um, the right engine started stopping. And um, as I recall, I don't know. I've never heard anybody else say this, but I think they let the fuel float 
and that engine had burned, you know, was just running so inefficiently, I guess, at that time. And, and uh, we both engines started. We were flying again, and he kind of veered off, you know, past Macomb, as I understand it. You know, people have different opinions of that, but uh, I never saw fire in the plane. You couldn't. It was during the day. You know, you wouldn't have seen it. Right. So down there, I, I guess we had passed Gillsburg, and, and then they started running out of fuel. And I, I've listened to the recording. You know, they were, Houston was controlling, and, and um, they banged back to get, go back to Macomb. So we literally did a U. And, um, boy, when he did that, we lost some power forward, and we sank down like a rock. That's when I was telling you, I swear, but it's not true, uh, that there was some power lines we nearly went right over. But I, I, I've looked for them and asked for people, because it's kind of one of my nightmares, you know. Right. For a long time, I'd, I'd sit there and have a dream about not being able to get high enough or low enough, go under the, you know, whatever. We started, uh, then uh, we were banking around, so I couldn't see where we were headed because, you know, that the wind is a little, and I'm just looking kind of up at the sky, and, and the engines are kind of trying to start, and I guess they put them in neutral, somebody said, I don't know. Like, then it got deathly quiet and um i asked gene he was sitting over there with you know with ronnie because that there was two seats here and then there were four seats and i i asked gene i said uh do you see where we can land <laughs> that was the first time i really kind of started worrying about mark howard had kind of made some comments you know he he, uh, but me, I was just the eternal optimist, and I thought we were going to make, you know, land. I don't And Gene looked at me. He said, no, I don't see anything. And it wasn't like a minute later we started hitting them damn trees. And at first of all, it was a little shh, and then bam, 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 bam. And then, you know, we went down, and it actually slowed us down. We probably hit the ground at about 80 or 70 miles an hour. And, um the because i've been back to the site you know and, and the, the guys that pulled us out said that the plane <coughs> had right into a big old tree and they just it's it, we came to an abrupt salt and that was if we'd have kind of maybe slowed down a little bit in your it, memory of it did it seem like it it happened really fast or did it like going down yeah oh yeah like my men yeah just Bam, bam, so, bam, bam. yeah pretty it, much you were in the air and the next thing you were you heard uh you know the limbs hitting then you were pretty much on the ground and that's when all hell broke loose i guess when yeah yeah <coughs> the limb kind of came through as the plane broke up and i remember that hit me kind of in the head and um I, we probably slammed into poor craig and and mark you know because mark Franks and I, he was sitting beside me. Um, we kind of woke up, not completely upside down, but the, none of the seats were still attached from what I've heard. So, and these were normal airline kind of first class seats and that they had ripped loose and we were kind of feet up in the air at about a 45. And I looked at Mark and said, we're really crashed. And, um, I had a hunk of steel sticking out of my arm. I was cut all over the place. I probably cut myself more getting out, too. Uh, Mark and I climbed out, and we were out, and uh, Kenny Peden and Artemis were out there. And, um, you know, it was still light enough to see a bit. It was getting dusk. It was about 7 at night. And... Um, Artemis went up there to see the pilots and they they weren't they were dead and he came back and told me to hold on to the tree. Um they'd give me energy, you know, that was the way Artemis was. You know? And uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and I watched he and Kenny and Mark Franks walk off into the woods and I go, Man, I sure as hell hope they have, you know, they're all right. And and then um I started feeling I think the shock was starting to wear off a of hair. And I, I I didn't want to stand up anymore. I was hurt. Both my knees were smashed, and I so I laid down, and and it was wet. 
I mean, it, it was kind of like wet to the point where it it, was, it really wasn't a swamp, but it, it had rain. I don't know, but it it was cold. It started getting cold. And I uh, I was laying there for about quite a while. And, and I heard, um, you know, I could hear people in the plane screaming and yelling. And then uh, Billy Powell, I heard him behind me. You know, I couldn't move over. And then he started screaming. His nose was gone. I said, Billy, we're all hurt. I'm sorry. I can't help you. And uh, then uh, then the world lit up. That's when the, the Coast Guard helicopters found us, right? And this guy repelled down from the hell. I saw him repelling down. And then, um, and then that's when all the farmers that were looking for us you know, all of a sudden they hummed it. But I got to tell you, if you go there and you walk through that briar bush, it just rips the hell out of you. I mean, and there was a little creek right there because they carried me across that. And, you know, when I've been back, it was pretty dry. I've been, when that night, I'm pretty sure it was pretty full because that they picked me up on a stretcher when after they, you know, I was one of the last ones out because dumbass me, this guy accidentally kicks me. You know, I look like a log or something probably laying there because, you know, the bright light, but the light kept moving off in the plane. You know, it was like, uh, uh, you know, a helicopter kind of moving around up there, but they, they were trying to hold it steady. And I think they saved some lives, but that guy repelled down and um, guy kicked me and I said, uh, hey, <laughs> He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I go, you go help my, you know, everybody else like a dumbass. It's like I should have had them haul me out right then. But and they, uh, but after a while, I could, you know, they they came, got me, put me on a stretcher. Then they, I got to that creek because it's a pretty deep crevasse, you know. Yeah. They said, man, can you walk? I go, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no. And that they had to float me across that creek. It, it was deep enough to that night because I got wet. We and actually I, took Craig back, and we and we took a drone. And you'll have to go back and look at one of the podcasts. And we and yeah. we took a drone and flew it and followed. Uh, it followed Craig uh, go and we and Craig went back to the site and walked through that. It was dry at the time last right. October, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's a deep. It's a deep. Uh, Creek. I mean, it, you know, when it's dry, but <clears throat> whenever you get a lot of rain, I, and you guys just to so happen that creek was full. At it was that pretty time. full. Yeah, because uh, you know, of course, I was on a stretcher. It was black. By then, it's like eleven at night. We'd been out there a couple of hours, and they threw me in the back of a pickup truck, and um, that was the only one in the pickup truck. And boy, it's like I think I've heard some of your other people talk. It's pretty rough, you know, you hurt and all that. It's a small little road. And we, I, I guess they had driven back in there, you know, and I could hear the tractors driving and they're trying to get us out of there. There, there was really no ambulances or, I, you know, I mean, it was a small town. They had to kick people out of the hospital because they worked on me in the lobby. Did you ever like when you, when did you first realize that you're like thinking to yourself, man, I can't believe I was just in the air a little while ago and here I am on the ground in a plane crash. I mean, did you kind of like have to, you know, pinch yourself and go, is this really happening? You know, well, you know, I thought I was, again, I'm the eternal optimist. I, I was thinking, man, that's laying there on the floor. And when Billy started talking about his nose being gone, Motion detected at the I, I started wiggling my I did a little research on myself, <laughs> you know, and um, you know I was bleeding pretty good, but I, I was I, I, I was okay. I the, just sitting in that chair that we were really in a crash. I told Mark, and then after that, I I, I just laid there. I I don't really remember what I was thinking because I laid there a couple of hours. I mean, it, it was a while, you know, an hour before the helicopter found us and ish. You know, I don't I wasn't really look at my watch but i was one of the last ones back to the airport i mean back to macomb that hospital there because um then you ended up with a bunch of stitches yeah a whole bunch and and, and uh i had a big old hunk my arm didn't quite straighten out but 
Other than that, um, I just got a lot of scratches, but I've been through the windshield a couple of times and <laughs> on cars, and it's been, uh, you know, I've been lucky. Yeah, I guess, you know, that, that goes along, you know, with being around rock bands. You're you're either getting in a car wreck or a plane crash or something, you know, it's always <laughs> something going on. Uh, I remember, I think it was Kenny Peden saying that, they were taking him to the hospital in a, in a truck. And he said the lady, I don't know if it was Brenda or who it was that was, uh, driving him, but she was going so fast. He, he was thinking to himself here, I survived a plane crash and she's going to kill me in this truck, you know, right. told her, Hey, <laughs> man, slow down, every, you know, every bump they hit, you just, Oh man. And yeah. I, you know, of course uh, th this guy's, I, I swear his name was Ben and he was uh, a DA and uh in macomb or somewhere he was telling me because you know it was about a 15 minute ride back to the oh yeah the that's a long ride yeah how long were you in the hospital uh about a week yeah and then at the time were you living in texas i've always lived in houston i, I yeah. came back here and um peter i talked to peter he thought i'd die they you know, that night it, it was like, cause he called me, I talked to him the next day in the hospital and my poor parents that they were at home. Right. And so it was a two story house and, uh, and, and a friend of his heard that the crash had happened. You know, it's not like today we're CNN where, I mean, they were just, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, he called my dad and and my mom got finally got mad at him because dad was trying to find out where well, he had no idea where we were you know there was no and uh they found out <laughs> we were in mississippi and then these uh and then uh so he finally mom got mad at him said what's going on he said well i think steve was in an airplane crash and you know you figure he's dead and um <laughs> So I'm laying there on the uh, on the old stretcher or whatever you call them, getting worked on, stitched up. This preacher, and I had a toe tag on. I'm <laughs> I'm going. What's this? They said, "Well, none of y'all had your wallets." I right? know, which is true. I didn't have my wallet. Fly with it. It was might have been sitting there. I don't know if I was winning or losing at the poker game, but. Um, but I heard the preacher go, he, he sat there and went, well, can I help you? And I said, well, maybe you should call my parents. <laughs> and, and I heard him back there, you know, the phone was kind of right there. And he said, um, um, yes, sir, Mr. Lawler, this is preacher so-and-so. And I go, oh, crap. You know, the first thing poor dad had to listen to was he was talking to a preacher. Oh, wow. Said, no, he's fine. He, he's he's all cut out, and, but he, he's going to be fine. So well, He's probably happy to hear that. Oh, you know? and then they got in the car, drove all night, and got there the next morning. Because Rodney Eckerman, I think I told you, he had come into my room that night before, and I said, who died, you know? And he said, Ronnie. When he said Ronnie, I thought it was his brother. And he said, no, Ronnie Van Zandt, he said, Dean, you know, he went down the list of people that had passed. And, uh, and then he helped me take my contacts out. And the next morning, my old man put his cigarette out on right in the contact. Because I was telling you, there was an ashtray in the hospital room. <laughs> and my yeah. dad was smoking and, you know. <laughs> so and then I had no contact. So, you know, I spent the rest of the time not being able to see. So. So how long did it take you to get over that before you got your sea legs back underneath you and you felt good again? I was home about two or three days, you know, back in, and um, we went out drinking at the hot spots, you know, I was, I was, I had, a, I was all bandaged up and everything. And, uh, I, uh, I, Peter was out filming a movie called Sergeant Pepper, the Lonely Hearts Club Band. And, uh, I flew out there, kind of hang with them for about two weeks. And then I got a phone call from a friend of mine who uh, asked me if I wanted to go out with Boss Skaggs. And so that's what I did that December. And um, so that was probably about the same time, Craig, that you went out with, uh, was it Marshall Tucker? 
What was that? I went out with Marshall Tucker in 84, I think. Was it, no, I, when, who was it you went out with after the plane crash, right after the crash? Foreigner. Foreigner. Yeah. 78, Foreigner. Yeah, and, 79 Journey, and then I was back with Ross at Tim Collins in starting in 80. 80. So you, went, you went right back to work, too, then, right, Steve? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was, I was only home about four days. I went out to L.A. for about a week. What was it like the first time you got back on another plane? Was that kind of freaky it, for it, you? Well, the first time I got on a plane was I flew home from Macomb, right? We we drove. They took put me in an ambulance and with my parents because their car wasn't there. And so we went up to Jackson, Mississippi and flew home. And I don't recall that scared me, you know, because it's kind of weird. You wear glasses, right? When you take them off, you kind of. Yeah you know, a little closed in. And, and I remember sitting in a middle seat. There's no way today I do that. None. I've become so claustrophobic. I had to sit in the front roller and I'll see. Anyway, we flew home and I was home about three or four days and I went out to LA and that flight got me a little bit. <coughs> it bumped pretty good out over the desert out there, you know, and, uh, and we stayed out there about a week or something like that. And um, then I went out with Boss Gags through the winter. And then I went out with Foreigner. I don't know when we started. It must have been like February or March. February is when I started with them, yeah. We're, uh, was it Foreigner where we got on that airplane in like Germany? Uh, was it I, I, didn't, I wasn't over in Europe with them. Oh. I, we we started Steve. Uh, I forgot what the lighting designer was name was. Steve. Uh, anyway, we started somewhere and tried. That's what I did that whole summer. I was thinking Bob O'Neill was the lighting designer when I was with him. Yeah, he wasn't when I was. Yeah, I know. I know Bob. Yeah. Well, when did you get it, it, played uh, tennis over there in the grass at that real famous? Uh, Tennis Wim place, Wimbledon, Australia. Yeah, oh, I don't know about the Australian. When was it that you got started in the in the Live Nation? Well, <clears throat> what it, it was called it was the company I worked for was Pace Performing Arts Conventions and Exhibition. They started in the Astrodome uh, in '65. There, there was four partners at the time. And they got to be, you know, one of them kind of designed and was the first one to do indoor motocross because they asked for no. And then they got big on that. They did some football games in 75. They uh, opened the Superdome and uh, Alan, who owned the company, was a major one, uh, met Louis Messina and brought him back to Houston. He started doing... Uh, you know, concerts in Houston and then kind of taking over. And that was, I remember that was the first time I think I saw Leonard Skinner. They were supporting the Who about right in there. I remember seeing them and, and um, when I started liking them. And they, um, in 78, you know, I knew all the guys because the company was here in Houston. So they had wanted us to come do the stadium show because they didn't know how to do a stadium show in 78, Cotton Bowl. And then, uh, so I kept doing their stadium shows and, uh, about the early eighties, 81, they, they say my start date was in 81, November of 81. I, I, I went to work for Pace and, uh, so we became the, one of the dom the nom dominating, uh, promoters in the U S uh, we started building amphitheaters in a lot of cities and, uh, Alan owned a theater company and. That was part. It was called Pace Theatrical. It was Pace Motorsports, Pace Concerts, um, and that lasted through the eighties. And uh, so, what exactly were you doing, um, Steve? I, I mean, what I'm calling is a promoter rep. So yeah. basically, what what I would do is I was the production manager for the for the promoter. So the production manager from the group, and it's still that way, calls the the local rep, which was me. And, uh, you know, just go, how many stage hands you need catering? What time you want to load in? Yada, 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 yada. And so each show is a little different depending on which band you're doing. Uh, and I did them all. And, uh, 
And then sometime in the 90s, this guy, he owned SFX. He he had uh, bought up all the, uh, he was a sports agent, and he had bought up all the AM radio stations, but he didn't like that. So I guess he wanted to sell them in this company out of San Antonio. It was called Clear Channel. They bought all his radio stations, and he took that money and bought up all the promoters. And we were the biggest one, probably, a seller door um, that he bought. And they he called it SFX Entertainment. And then he got bored with that, and they, they sold the company to Clear Channel Radio. So Clear Light didn't have anything to do with oh, Clear no. Channel. They were way gone by then, Rodney. Oh. Rodney was what Rodney was working with us. He he came to work to Pace too. He he was kind of managing the uh, amphitheater division through the eighties and early nineties. I remember and, Cellar Door. Um, seemed like I mean we used to do. They used to have like uh, the T Bowl over in Orlando and stuff like that. And it seemed like Cellar Door was always promoting that. And yeah, that well, they was, were the East Coast. So and they still kind of are, but they. They, they're owned by the companies called Live Nation because uh, they got bought. They were kind of involved. I mean, Jack Boyle, who started Cellar Door, was our CEO for a while. Um, and, and, you know, he was our big boss. And then they, so they were bought by Clear Channel Radio, but we ended up being a little bit of a boat anchor. We weren't making any money. So they spun us off and it's called Live Nation. And, um, uh, so you've been basically doing the same thing ever since like 81, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, what's, what's it like nowadays compared to back then, as far as the way things are done, any different? I mean, it's, Oh, it's night and day. Yeah. I mean, back then, you know, it was pretty loosey goosey. People stole money. There was, you know, it was a cash business. I don't think it's any stretch the imagination the mafia was involved in some of the stuff in the middle 70s and um then it became a real business and today it is a business i mean sponsorship lawyers hr oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah it, it's... yeah back back when you started there was no such thing as merchandise people didn't even have sell t-shirts and merchandise oh no uh -uh. i remember yeah. peter asking me one time how much he should have made uh, i said well probably about 10 percent, you know the gross and he never saw a penny of it his manager and the managers were ripping everybody off and, you know it was a cash business and um anyway then nowadays it is a business i mean you know Ticketmaster is owned by Live Nation, and and uh, it's a mega, mega. Way you know, more organized. All around nature. the world. I mean, they own companies all over Europe, Russia. China, I don't know about Russia. China, um, uh, Japan, Australia. They they huge corporation. Well run. Are you, like, more at, at a position now where you kind of, sort of pick the gravy stuff, you know, I mean, you know, oh, you I've gotta... been there for a long time. <laughs> Somebody's going to yeah. probably shoot me for that. Oh yeah. 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 So you're not like really, uh, doing a lot of overseas stuff, just more. No, no. Uh, we, the only thing we ever did as far as being the local promoter rep was, uh, you know, pace we did, we went over, we built some amphitheaters in Europe. And I, I've had to be, I was the promoter rep for Mexico for about a year or two. That was a lot of fun. Let me tell you. <laughs> anyway, I did some stone shows down there for us, and uh, but generally it's just been the United States and Canada. So you're yeah. pretty, you're pretty much still full time then. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it's a little this year's. I did 40 stadium shows last year, I think. What was it like during COVID uh, when that was shut down? Yeah, were you so you were taking a little vacation? Yeah, we, it was funny because I was doing, uh, we were rehearsing Chris Stapleton in Corpus Christi. And, and he was opening the brand new Rangers baseball stadium. And um, I flew up there. We started the stage and I flew back on Wednesday 
to do the show and and uh you know it was the grand opening of the stadium fireworks mayors cutting the you know rope it's gorgeous stadium room and uh hey um i get a phone call from my friend he goes how much are we paying for catering you know by the hour i go well, i was thinking what the hell kind of it's 10 30 at night it was the first show of chris stapleton's tour and they they going home that was one and done and i had to fly back to dallas and he didn't want anybody to know you know before the mayor knew that chris stapleton wasn't coming and and that was it. I flew home. Oh, yeah. So they canceled it, and then it was like two years you were off then, huh? Oh, no. We, we got back to work <clears throat> in the fall, kind of putting it back together. Um, you know, because coming out of COVID was kind of strange. You know, we had to change a lot of stuff, and people wearing my mask, and, and they, they, they restructured the company some, you know, during that time. So, uh we got back to work a little bit and yeah, it was, it, it was weird doing shows, especially, you know, going to like new Orleans and stuff still kind of beat up. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, people don't, excuse me, people, people, when you're talking about doing a stadium show, I, I've, I've worked a couple of stadium shows with the union and, 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 and production, you, you start loading in like two days before the show starts. I mean, oh, yeah, we, you have we, to we, totally re, uh, put down floor and, and, uh, put down a stage and, and build, uh, just crazy stuff, man. <laughs> and you wonder how the economics of it sometimes is. It's like, yeah, we generally say it takes three days of stage, one production show and one day out. You know, and, and it, it's funny, speaking of things changing, we used to do the stage on the grass, just grass, right? <laughs> and and um, th then we, we got tarps because it became more astroturf. And now we spend 200 grand just to cover the floor. I mean, the, the expenses are... Wow. Yeah, well, you yeah, have to yeah. build towers just to put the spotlights up on Oh yeah, I'm saying you know, out in the out in the in, you know, but then you have them up in the up in the yeah, up that, in the. That's, uh, that's a band's choice. Eh? We yeah. call it delay towers, and sometimes we try to hang them, and <clears> you know, and then you got to you, your uh, sound board. You got to put it about <laughs> thirty feet in the air. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a big that's a big battle. A lot of times with sound that the sound guys about. Exactly how far that mixer goes back. We, we, so get you, a tape, we get a tape measure and cut a few feet, you know, cut about eight feet out at about 20 feet and tie it back together. Like, oh, you see, it's 150 feet, about 180. As, as somebody that goes to concerts, we always heard that if you were up, if you were by the soundboard, that was the best place to be to, to get the best uh, music off of the stage. Is that it, true? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, theoretically, yeah. Why is it that you you uh, do amphitheaters mostly now? We own them. Oh, is that what it is? So you own the is it is it uh, easier to do amphitheaters? Well, or we, what's we the... built them from day one because uh, I saw I was out at Pine Knob. I came back to Houston, you know, after seeing a couple of amphitheaters, Wolf Creek. Saratoga Springs, I, I talked to the, the Beckers about building amphitheaters, you know, that, and so we started designing from the Rodney and I did, and, um, but we built a couple and then we learned how not to do it. And then we built one in Nashville and then Dallas, Atlanta, you know, Philadelphia, the ones you went to in Florida, Coral Sky, you know, all of those, uh, we designed them to where, first of all, the ushers, there's less ushers, um, stage hands, you know, easy to load in, rigging really easy, you know, I could go up there and do it. But that's up so there. when you, when the company designed them, they made them more user friendly, I guess, to uh, save money and make well, money, more them, money. Yeah. Yeah. We built them, the, the production guys as best we could to have more loading docks and plenty of power and all the problems in the amp, you know, in the arenas. 
And a lot of times, because the arenas are busy doing NBA basketball, it's difficult to get into them sometimes. So that there's kind of started a, um, you know, a tour. You actually do amphitheater tours. These guys go out on them. And, you know, I, after COVID's over, one of the biggest things that's affected our business is the cost of stuff going up. I mean, people, it's like, inflation is so hard to you know it's like one guy raises the price well you raise the price and another, you know the trucking has doubled like buses you know and some of these tours have upwards of 20 30 trucks and even gets more than that in the big one and then 20 buses and these damn things are running you know eight grand a night i mean a week and you start multiplying that out and it COVID's slowed us down a hair. <laughs> yeah. You know? And people, people don't realize you're talking about doing a stadium show. How many, how many, um, stage hands are necessary to do a stadium oh. show? Well, you know, we, we run into that problem a lot. Like everybody else has had, we've had some labor issues. I mean, you know, like you come through Texas and in, in, uh, New Orleans kind of at the same time, you know, you do, there's 250 stagehands in Dallas and then and the, the Houston's got 250. There's not that many stagehands. I mean, you get down to some of those guys and you go, where did these guys come from? You know, and you, we've, we've had a lot of shortages in labor. I mean, it's been difficult. Yeah, when they do shows here in Cleveland, there's stagehands from Pittsburgh and Youngstown and Columbus and and oh, yeah. uh, all the everywhere around. There's stagehands from everywhere coming to do those shows. Is that so union? Is it union? Yeah, yeah. It's because there's well, so many stagehands needed. Yeah, some union, some non-union. We um, oh, it's gotten to the point now where we <clears> times on those stadium shows, you're paying a hundred thousand dollars for travel to the stadium because they're just you know and these and stagehands are, are making thirty dollars an hour now plus percentage <laughs> <laughs> and then over time yeah I, oh it's it's yeah, crazy it's yeah stage, stage stagehands make good money man you see especially when you work over too. eight hours you get time and a half and that's double time and then you know those stadium shows you work a lot of extra hours man some of those stadium shows, especially up where you're around, you are, they're a million dollars. Oh, my God. I worked some of them Rock and Roll Hall of Fame shows, and I, I was up there two days straight, man. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Made good money. <laughs> How many days out of the year do you think that you're gone working, Steve? Uh, last, I, I was gone about like, like last year, which was my slowest year. I, I, I do about 150 shows <coughs> <clears throat> that's a lot though i mean oh yeah yeah maybe 120 150 you know depending on the year now of course i'm counting like a stadium shows like seven days right so you know maybe i only did 80 shows in one year but i, I was gone sometime 250 days a year gone last year I, um because i just did stadiums that's all i do now um couple of arena shows if they need me but not not much they, they uh i left in about june and got home in october just gone so how much longer do you think you're going to be doing this um getting near the end starting to wind down are you starting to wind down well maybe you can you know just do a little bit here and there just to keep you you know a little active oh yeah I, i'm sure I, they're going to be bugging you to do that anyway well, you know, it's funny because I, I enjoy the the job. I mean, we've been real lucky to be in a business where I never had to wear a suit and tie. I wear my sandals to work. You know, yeah. Really like until that. recently, have put up with a lot of rules. You kind of did thing on your own. It's been a real enjoyable life. Very. You got to meet a lot of cool people. Yeah, and some assholes. <laughs> yeah, and I think you even told me that you you had some other airplane incidents that were like kind of like close calls and things well, you, like that. I I've flown over five thousand times, so 
it gets to you. But, you know, they nearly all happened in the 70s. I, I was in a couple of uh, runway incidents on friends' airplanes. I've been in a couple of the plane didn't take off again. Uh, then I was in the Skinner when I, I got to tell you, when I was coming back from Honolulu a year later, damn 747 blew up an engine and caught mm. on fire and we had to go back to Honolulu. That was about, that was about the scariest thing that I, yeah. They, you know, the stewardesses, they all go remain calm. My ass. That ain't well, that's ass. like a hotel <laughs> flying in the air. That thing's huge. I, oh, mean, yeah. I used to work on those 747s and when you look at the landing gear and just looking at it it's hard to figure out how that thing folds up into the wing it's so crazy it's just it's amazing did you ever tell the stewardess you were in a plane crash and you needed a drink and get a free drink <laughs> i got several <laughs> yeah Mark Howard, I remember one time, poor old Mark, we, we were landing. I, I saw his pod, he talking about Willie Nelson, but I remember one time we landed in Greenville, Spartanburg at that dam. We, not the airport we took off from because it was a private airport, but we landed back in that city. He, he was shook up. He had about five stewardesses on his lap. That was the hard <laughs> way. He, he, well, you looking know, funny. I was doing the Eagles, I think, last year in, in Greenville, right? I hadn't been back there in a while. Back there, <laughs> we did tours with the Dixie Chicks and uh, Fleetwood Mac, and I, I don't, I think they, it was called the Bilo Center. But anyway, I went there and uh, we did the Eagles, and um, the next month, you know, we did, it was not the same building. I think they tore down the Bilo Center. But anyway, the Bilo Center was exactly in the same place for where we, that old auditorium we did the last Skinner show was. And, and I got in an Uber, and this guy said, yeah, that place there, that was the last place Skinner played. And I go, yeah, I was there. And, I, I started <laughs> and then, you know, he didn't believe me, right? I mean, th there were so many people that, and I'm sure Craig has just said, you know, that, oh, I was going to be on the plane. I, it only held the people that were on there. That poor one photographer, I don't, he just, I think he just flew once with us, I think. I mean, yeah, anyway, he was... so he, the guy was asking me some legitimate questions and, I, and finally he got to him. Yeah, I was there. So why wasn't there a sound man on there with that film guy? That's why I don't never understand. He wasn't, I, I thought he was a photographer. I mean, he, he, uh, cause wasn't he out there with Pepsi? I thought he was a film guy with Pepsi. Bill he Sykes. Might have, he might have been. I, I don't know. It's like, and I, I could I, never understand. It said cameraman. Yeah. And, I, and I would never could have, because they were doing that Pepsi documentary. Is that what it was? Because, yeah, I, I, I never Pepsi film, I, actually. I don't know if I ever even talked to him. I mean, it's like, you know. He's he probably was, trying to just forget about it now. <laughs> now I, you know, I wonder what happened to him. You know, I've kind of kept up Jim Brace. Uh, I see Kevin Elson a lot. Uh, I used to, you know, he's a sound guy. And um, Jim and Mark, Ronnie uh, Eckerman, he passed. Uh, you know, they were kind of the guys. And, and Donnie Crutchmeyer, I saw him a lot before he passed. And I still talk to Clayton Johnson every day. Do you? Day. Tell him hey yeah. for me. I, you know, because oh, yeah, yeah. wife yeah. real well. She, yeah, uh, Sherry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're doing real well out there, man. Yeah. Well, he, they, he, never, he never went back out again. I don't I no, I no, no. I haven't he seen just, him since. You know, we were all in the hospital walking around going to each room. And I remember I walked down there with him and. Uh, that's where I, I don't know if I'd known Sherry before cause she worked for Bill Graham and yeah. then I, I he was just telling, he was just telling me he's got a, a really rare heart condition. Oh yeah. I just talked to him, you know, and he, he said, yeah, it's, he's got something that's really, really rare. And, and, well, Sherry, uh, Sherry left Bill Graham was at that time. Well, she didn't well, leave Nation. and Bill Graham died and she kind of no, no. took, took we over. Bought, Live Nation bought Bill Graham a long time before he died. Oh, really? Oh, wow. I uh, know. Maybe not. You know, you, you, he, when he was killed in that airplane, you know, that helicopter, 
that Steve Killer, his name was Steve Kahn. Uh, Steve uh, Steve Killer Kahn. He he was one of the. He he did a lot of uh, Santana. And one day we we were with Frampton. We play in the the, uh, the Santa Barbara Bowl, and we went back up there. And you know the show was over as the afternoon show because it was you know you couldn't do any lights there then. And they um. And then we went back up and Steve was flying the damn airplane that I was going. It was just me and him. I go, who's flying this? He says, I am. It was the prettiest flight I ever took. Because everybody else flew to San Francisco. I had to go to Oakland to start the loading. And um, anyway, I'm jumping around here. But that, that okay. And then he was flying the helicopter when Bill Graham died. No kidding. Oh, so you well, knew that was, the guy. That, yeah. that was Bill, Bill Graham Productions. That's yeah, what, and yeah. they sold BGP. Out. Yeah, BGP because they, they sold into Live Nation, which it was called SFX at the time. Oh, really? They they sold into that, and then yeah, that we were called Live Nation. I'm pretty sure, but she started another company, her and Greg Perloff, uh, that does pretty well out there in San Francisco. So. Yeah, yeah, they do pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I see that because I was there with the Dixie Chicks when the the day she uh, moved on. <laughs> we were talking before uh, we we started recording, and um, and you said that you uh, worked pretty close, and you were pretty close friends with Jimmy Buffett. Oh yeah, yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> I I probably did two or three hundred shows, stadium. There were we had a lot of good stories. About Jimmy. Yeah, give give us a Jimmy Buffett story. You got one? <laughs> well. I don't want to be too long here, but I we started this stadium tour. It was called the uh, Margaritaville tour. And, and again, people remember this story a little differently, but this is my take on it. So we played in this horseshoe place, and this guy, Tag and Nan, Jimmy, they, they were New Orleans people, and he knew them from Jazz Fest, because I think they both still do the Jazz Fest. And... Um, so he wanted it all the the concession stands direct, decorated like Margaritaville, and so Tag and Nan that they, they kind of built it that, and, and it was great. It took us two flatbeds to carry it everywhere, but they um, they built a volcano out there. Uh, it was about ten feet high, and so I was waiting for it to do something, and it went poof. It was like lame. I said, Tag. <laughs> And so we went to, I don't know, we did about five or six stadium shows. And every time it got a little bit bigger. And the last one we were doing, is, it was called Buckeye Lake. I think they call it Legend Valley now. This, I, you've never seen that many drunk people in your whole life. It, it was just a gorgeous day. And they had built this volcano and they wanted to prove something, I guess. And this damn thing had to have been 30 feet tall. And it was built on some about 16 feet of scaff and then it, they got one of those concrete cardboard tubes you know that make the foundations for bridges and they ran some wires up there and it had rubber foam it looked like the flintstones had big old you know markings on it and so and i mean it, it, there was 60 70 thousand people it was kind of an amphitheater it sat 13 in the seats and uh, about 40 or 50 it was a natural hill i mean people were drunk and um we'd have we had this blow up shark that had to go somewhere <laughs> we put it out on this rider truck that they were selling merch out of and it was sitting up there you know watching show just part of the deal this shark was about 30 feet long anyway it got stolen it came down the hill and was running over everything and they, they were having trouble with it was getting on the stage and somebody out at the mixer killed it that was the end of the shark <laughs> and then I, I guess the next song for those who know is music he has a song called volcano and that's when they blew the volcano right so i'm looking out there just you know curious the volcano has been cool look it's been smoking all day well, they shot up the pyro, but they didn't go high enough, you know, just, and it came down in the crowd. And it was about six, seven hundred feet out there. I can barely, you know, but I go, oh, now we're going to have some people hurt and lost. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and, and so then I look back up just and it wasn't very long, but 
you know, about 10 seconds or so, I looked back out there and the damn thing was on fire. Oh, no. It was a very short-lived fire. And Jimmy just threw the, the set list out, just started playing the songs. And after the show was over, the fire marshal, who happened to be in the audience, wanted to talk who was in charge. <laughs> It wasn't me. That's all I knew. So we, we started hiding. It was just, you know. But like, nobody got hurt? Anybody get hurt? I don't I don't recall. I, they were probably too drunk to know they were hurt. Yeah. I remember, you know, I was telling you, Jimmy Buffett came out and uh, played at the last space shuttle launch. And, um, and I remember it was like some really ominous looking rain clouds coming and, and, uh, and when he got out of his car and I was standing there, you know, and he's looking up at it and he wasn't worried about it. And, and he got up on stage and I think I even recorded him saying, and he says, don't worry, it's never rain on a Jimmy Buffett show. I don't know if that's true or not. Oh, but I got to tell you the next year after the Buckeye, we went back to Buckeye Lake. It rained. There was probably about eight or 10 inches of mud under the stage. It, all the cables were covered. Oh, wow. And I remember sitting back there, we were talking to Jimmy because he's a pilot. And, and uh, what do you think? Well, I didn't want to load in again. So I had alternative method. Let's do this damn show. And uh, it kept raining and we, we did it, but it was raining. <laughs> so it did. It has rained on a Jimmy Buffett show. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I've been yeah. there. <laughs> Well, what sticks out in your mind as a, as a wrap up here, uh, Steve, what sticks out in your mind? It's kind of like one of the most memorable things that you can think of that, uh, that you experienced, maybe something that sticks in your um, mind. No, nothing really. I, I, they, it's been a real fun, um, you know, you, you could go on about a lot of stories about people and, I don't know. Most of the stadium shows we had fun. Like, well, I did this George Strait tour for about four or five years. Got to know them. And uh, we had this tent that uh, instead of a dressing room, we'd build it. We'd have George's bus come in there and um, we'd have parties. Oh, they were fun. Yeah. And uh, uh, one night, um, it was during the day Kenny Chesney had played and then Tim McGraw was on the stage. We were in Buffalo at the, where the Bills play. And, uh, I came up there and somebody said, well, they throwing Kenny and Tim in jail. Oh, wow. And, and I went up there because what had happened was this, this girl had been sitting there all day just trying to find one of the artists, right? So she had this horse. It didn't say cop horse on it. It just it's this horse. And the girl's sitting there holding it. She's pretty young. And, and uh, I, I kept going by her. And, and so I didn't know that. But evidently, Kenny jumped on the horse, rode up. To, there was a hill right there on stage left. And um, a cop grabbed him, threw him off. And I guess Tim hit the cop. Oh. Oh, yeah. It was a big mess there. Man. Surprise we hadn't read about that, huh? <laughs> well, the, there's been some songs about it. I guess, yeah, look it up. Tim and uh, Kenny went to jail that day. It was, he had to do some stuff. And I don't know. We, we had, a, you know, that tent was a lot of fun. It was like, I don't know. Every, every show had a different story, right, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure, yeah. Hey, Craig, you got anything you want to mention before we wrap it up? Nah, I got some stuff that we'll just talk about. I had some couple of donations and stuff. We'll, we'll just talk about it Monday, I guess. Yeah, okay. Well, man, uh, that, that's so good. Y'all do that. Man. So, so the uh, eclipse is coming near you, right, Craig? Yeah, it's coming right over, right over my house, but it's supposed to be cloudy. You're not supposed it to. It is here, too, you know, because it was funny. It. I, I, um, I called up my hotel contact in San Antonio. I have a favorite hotel in every city, but the one in San Antonio, I called her up about a month ago and I said, well, um, I'd like a room on the seventh and eighth, you know, cause I, I figured I'd drive to San Antonio, which is about four hours from here. And then it's about another half hour, hour. And then that way I can go where the clouds are. No, well, I wasn't thinking that then I, 
<laughs> I had an idea right where I was going. And they um and she said, Oh yeah, no big problem. It was a four night minimum. Oh yeah. Six hundred dollars a night for a hotel I pay about two hundred a night for. I'm going and she helped me out. So I, I'm driving to San Antonio on Sunday and then uh you know, my daughter, she's flying in from Phoenix because they we work the final four every year. She does. I hadn't done it in the last couple of years, but they're out in Phoenix. And so she's going to fly into San Antonio. And we're all going to drive out there. But now the clouds, it's not looking so bueno. So I, I saw one in Nashville. We were doing Coldplay at the NRG here in Houston. And I told the, the site coordinator, I, I got to go to this. You know, you don't. I'm kind of a space guy, you know, <laughs> like Griff there, right? I wanted to, I saw a couple of rockets take off from Canaveral. Yeah. That, it, you know, if you have never seen like a, a heavy lift rocket, that's something that you got to put on your, uh, Boy, they, your you know, that list. is a trip because yeah. they built an amphitheater down in Brownsville that they want us to come do some shows in, but it's just teeny little things at about 3000, but they built it to where you can watch the, um, you know, most things taken off. Oh yeah. SpaceX. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Cause you can drive right up there. Cause I, we, we, I was down in Brownsville and you could literally drive within a hundred feet of those rockets. Yeah. It's, so it's, I, it's down on Boca Chica, that beach down there. And, uh, I've always, thought about going down there and watching that thing take off i tell you some of the uh the coolest things is when they blow up i've seen three oh, of them so. yeah i've seen three of them blow up and it's just it's scary because you know you don't know you know they got all kinds of uh of fuels on their uh hydrogen tetroxide and all this uh you know hydrogen and stuff and all that stuff you're wondering where it's going you know and you, and you but you're you're so mesmerized at what you just saw you kind of just want to sit there and look at it but they're well, they're ushering you into an air-conditioned building but, i uh, saw uh i saw one of the uh the uh, voyagers take off oh yeah Every time I see one of those, I wonder which one it is. I saw it that come because we were down there. I think it might have been Gary Wright or Frampton or something. Seventy eight nine ish when that took off. So yeah, so I don't know, but I remember them saying, "Yeah, this one's going." And I use those things are still going after all these. Yeah, now they're using solid rocket motors, which you know it's got a whole different <laughs> sound to it, and you know it's just like a. It's, it's just so you can you know your clothes flutter and it's just it's amazing you know the power those things have but uh, is that your rock there you got in the mail craig yeah that's a rock from the beach in maine that's, <laughs> that's a cool rock cool. it's got sparkles in it yeah, yeah it does. i see i see the sparkles yeah it's pretty wild but anyway, I, th I think it's great y'all doing this and helping out some of our buddies and, uh, you know. Yeah, we appreciate you coming on because, um, you know, it. a lot of people, they like to hear, you know, you guys, you and Craig, you know, you were around. It's like nothing to you guys. You think back and it's like it was a job. But, you know, people like me and people that listen to the podcast – they just can't get enough information about backstage stories and things. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, we get a lot of really good comments and people are very interested and they, you know, and they appreciate when we bring people like you on and uh, you're one of our better guests. We haven't uh, had anybody on in a while, have we Craig? So it's, uh, we appreciate no, you no. coming on. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Anything. If y'all ever want me to do something again, just give me a call. They, uh, you know, it's funny when you mention that people will walk up to you. They think the sound and lights are always in the building, you know, and now the, these shows have become so much a Broadway show. I mean, like I, I saw Madonna the other night. Holy crap. It, it's yeah. Like, you know, and people don't realize that it's like 20 or 30 trucks carrying these people around. And, and probably like Madonna's carrying about 200 roadies. So, you know, 
You divide What's, about 12 people in each bus, and it's a lot of buses, too. Yeah, yeah. When, when you started, it was just par, uh, trusses and par cans. Oh, know? yeah, and, 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 you know, and, and, and the truck. We would, <laughs> yeah. we'd load in, drive the truck all night, get to the next city. And your biggest job was changing those those gels and oh, the, yeah. and the par cans, you know? Now, yeah. you know now now lights are god you, it's just it's just unbelievable the lights and they're so expensive my oh, god they have, to have technicians to run them their lights are thousands of dollars a piece man it just used to be like uh, maxwell hoff coffee cans with a with a with a with a gel across the blue or red or <laughs> magenta oh yeah i don't know if i can find it <laughs> I have one of the pad our stickies. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I should have I should have held it up for you. Found it. Oh well, you know, because all this stuff <laughs> came back to use. You know, the trucks and 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 all the. I remember the the wardrobe case with all his hats in there. Oh, and, that all came back there because it all ended yeah. up in Jacksonville, and we done. Well, they they, they it off Ronnie, the... you know, they didn't know what to do with it, so they brought it back. And I remember we unloaded it out of the truck because it had to go, and we switched trucks. Oh, I'm talking about all the stuff that was in the airplane ended up in the in the when the warehouse when they put the stuff in the warehouse, and then the stuff from the hospital showed up in jacksonville and they just threw all those clothes in there on top of all the equipment right. no th this was a wardrobe case i remember you know and all the guitars and all that they unloaded them into our warehouse at Clearlight, uh and they were there a couple of days before they decided what to do and because that was when i got back from la i guess right before i went out with boss guy i remember seeing those hats because i was uh um uh, do you remember oh, how many hats you saw? Do you remember how many hats you saw in that case before? There had been quite a few, you know, because they were from a company called Texas Hatter. Yeah, but uh, you remember you don't remember how many of them were Ronnie's because, you know, Gary had some hats too. Yeah, I, I don't remember because, you know, Big Robert had them made down there at, at Texas yeah. here in Houston. And, yeah, I remember that was so weird looking at that, all that stuff. I remember there was a big old boxes of our sticky passes, and I don't know what happened to all that stuff. Those things, everybody probably likes some of that crap, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be, I yeah. think I have one or two of them somewhere. Which which one, the skull and crossbones ones? No, no, it had a picture of the band. It said, Tour of the Survivors, they were great. Oh, yeah, 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 it yeah. It was just our sticky passes. For, yeah. If y'all still showing this, I don't know. But then now, you know, people have laminate passes, so we didn't have to switch passes every night. That was a big kind of thing. When I, and we have stickies, we call them. Yeah, that's what we, uh, those Rossington Collins were sticky passes. Uh, yeah, and and they, yeah. Uh, that's for guests and opening acts and stagehands. You generally write in a Sharpie what it is. Nowadays, they want your picture on them, half of them. They make everybody take their picture and get a COVID test. And, <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah yeah it's just, it, it, it's it's not as fun I, <laughs> yeah I definitely remember, you know, there's seven eight security guys with every show and um, yeah i worked i worked as a, a local union until until all that covid stuff took effect uh, and i said no i'm done <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of that's the reason we've had so, a lot of labor issues is too because it's just not as much fun. I mean, people now they try to make the stagehands eat out in the just with a box lunch when we all used to eat together and it was kind of time you met and you know discuss stuff and and you know everybody got a t-shirt and a few comp tickets here and there. And nowadays, business don't come into the building, you know. Yeah, so, it's changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, it really, but that, that was a lot of that was starting to happen pre COVID. COVID just really put it in high gear. So, anyway. all right. Well, hey, Craig, go ahead and, and clap us out and hang around there uh, um, and 
for a little bit, Steve, and uh, we'll talk about uh, what you might want to edit out of this thing. Uh, so we, <laughs> and we make sure that we don't put anything in here you don't want. So we appreciate you coming on and, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll get you back on again sometime. And thanks Anytime, a lot. Man. All righty then. Happy trails to you until we meet again and see you later. Alligator at the wild crocodile. And cut.